This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and uh, I'm out on the road walking today because uh, while normally I run in the afternoons, my my back's been sore recently, so I'm taking a walk instead, and I'm going to use the time out on the road to address an issue that I'd like to talk about based on a conversation I had with a parent yesterday. One of the challenges that homeschool parents face is that they they don't necessarily have teaching experience. This is what this is especially true of parents with young children who have never been through the cycle yet. They're ambitious, they're zealous, and they look at this little child and they say, we're going to work as hard as we can to give you the best education possible. And so they get to work and they have no real sense of goals or timelines or milestones. All they can think is, we just need to work as as fast as we can. And they come in very impatient, very anxious. And when I get a chance to talk to such parents, I tell them, you need to calm down. Because education is a long-term project. Education is not a is not a sprint. Education is a marathon. And it doesn't work the way that inexperienced parents think that it does. And so there's a lot to learn about the practical management of the education of a child. And parents have to realize that this work that they're undertaking in homeschooling, especially if they're dealing with a young child, is going to take years and years, not weeks. So in the conversation I had this weekend, a parent wrote, I was actually chatting with a parent on the website, And the parent was concerned because the child wasn't making significant progress or wasn't making satisfactory progress in the Academy's Latin Reading 1 course. And the parent was considering dropping the child down into petty school classes. The child was actually nine years old, so this is a child who doesn't belong in petty school courses, but is a third or fourth grade student in modern terminology and should be able to get started in classical studies. And as we talked, the parent shared her concerns, and her concerns were about the pace at which the child was progressing. And I told the mother that this stress that she was going through was all artificial, that she was actually the source of this stress, that there, there is no real reason for concern or for any negative interpretation in the child's work simply because he's moving along slowly. That's how studies go. And what I explained is that over the course of a child's education, 
progress <clears throat> increases exponentially. And if you don't know what that means, that progress increases exponentially, it means that progress doesn't increase in a straight line from beginning to end. But progress starts slowly and increases more and more as the student gets older. And so progress works like an upward slope rather than a straight line. Most parents who get into education, most inexperienced teachers imagine that progress works in a straight line. And because they don't see initial achievement, they start to panic like something's wrong. Because they've created this model in their mind for what the child's progress should look like. And yet that model is incorrect. That's not how it works. The beginning is always slow. And progress increases more and more over time. A good example of this can be understood by anyone who's learned to play the piano. If a student has a good piano teacher, that teacher will take time. That teacher will teach the child how to sit at the piano, how to sit properly. The teacher will teach the student about proper posture, hand placement, the angles of the arm, and so forth. And they'll work on those basic techniques. The teacher will take time to show the child how to move his fingers on the keyboard. The teacher may take some time to teach piano theory, teaching, teaching the child to name the keys and so on. And these, these initial lessons will take time. The child will learn no songs. There will be no recitals, no performances. But the good teacher will be laying the foundations for future progress. And then the teacher, again, assuming this is a good piano teacher, a real master, the teacher will begin training the child in drills that strengthen the child's fingers, reinforce the lessons on proper posture and technique, and that little by little develop the dexterity or coordination of the child's fingers upon the keyboard. And the good instructor will focus on these basic skills. Again, there will be no attempt to rush into music or songs, but time will be given to the development of these basic skills. And weeks and weeks, months and months will go by. And if the parent asks, well, what songs can you play? The child might say, my instructor hasn't taught me any songs yet. I'm just working on these lessons and exercises. And you can imagine the, the parent who has no experience with instruction getting frustrated because the parent wants to see some progress. And the parent's idea of progress is some show, some performance. And so the parent will start to complain that the child's not making progress. But the experienced teacher knows what he or she is doing. 
they know that these basic skills, once mastered, will allow for real progress. And that progress, if pursued in the right way, at the right time, will be far greater than the superficial progress that will appear in the student whose teacher simply trains him to imitate the playing of songs. When the time does come to learn a song, the well-taught student will be told to practice slowly and perfectly. To play only as fast as he can play without making any mistakes and without without ignoring or neglecting the proper technique that he's been taught slowly and perfectly. The phrase, practice makes perfect, will be explained to be false because perfect practice makes perfect. And so the student will begin slowly just playing a few notes at a time and paying attention to the movement of the fingers and he'll focus on perfection and then over time he'll be able to play through the entire song slowly but perfectly and then Once he's practiced all the proper technique and has learned the song, also learning to read the music rather than simply memorize and imitate the tune on the piano, the student will begin to practice and move more quickly until until the true pace of the song is finally reached and the student can in the end play both perfectly and properly as regards the pace of the song. And this is how progress works. And once the student learns his first song, He's been walked through the entire process by his teacher. He sees how it started slowly, but he worked to perfect the song slowly. And then once the song was learned slowly and perfectly, in a little bit of time, he was able to increase the speed until he played the song at the proper pace without any errors and with perfect technique. And he'll see by experience that process for how a song is studied and practiced. And when it's time for the next song, he'll be able to work with the same patience but will be able to move a little more quickly because he'll understand the process. And he'll continue studying the theory, reviewing his technique, and studying new music over time. And as he goes on, his ability to learn new songs, especially as his ability to read the music improves, his mastery of the keyboard improves, his technique leaves him without any bad habits or injuries. He'll be able to study and learn new music more and more efficiently over time. And his 
his achievement will increase exponentially. That's how true achievement works. The beginning is slow, and then the achievement increases by larger and larger quantities as he moves forward. And this is why there's an old saying that says the beginning is half of the whole. The beginning is half of the whole. That saying means that when we begin something well, even though we may just be at the beginning of it, if we begin it well, we're halfway to the end. Because beginning well is a big part of the challenge. And a good teacher who is principled and patient will emphasize the importance of beginning slowly and patiently and paying attention to the right way of doing things. The good teacher won't be pressured by an impatient parent's demand for songs, for show, for recitals, and so on. The good teacher will explain to the parent that that's not how the student should proceed if he wishes to make real progress long term. And what's true in piano study is true in real intellectual study as well. The beginning is half of the whole. Parents who are impatient, who are looking for some kind of superficial appearance of learning, usually by focusing too much on academic content, and not enough on the development of actual skill in independent study, will be frustrated and anxious when the child begins. And the real danger of this, which reveals the foolishness of it, is that the parent will end up making decisions about the child's education based on this inexperienced and false opinion of the student's early progress. And will set a ceiling over what the child is able to accomplish long term. Because the parent wouldn't, wouldn't listen to an experienced teacher who has walked many students through the entire cycle of studies. And as I said, education is not a sprint. It's a marathon. <clears throat> and the problem that many parents have is they often try to accomplish things in education by spurts and starts. They fall behind or they find themselves in trouble and they imagine that by working really, really hard for a short time, they'll be able to make it right. But that's just not how education works. Education is a reward of consistency, of patience, of perseverance, of quality, 
And the effort, however zealous it may be, of a couple of days cannot compare with the value of a steady, consistent routine of study maintained for years and years. When boys used to come to the boarding school, the first lesson I used to teach them was to learn to be boring. I used to tell them, you have to learn to be boring. Because the work of true study is boring. It's the same thing day by day. The growth is not radical. It's not maybe not even visible or sensible to the student, but over time, the growth is real. It's where we get all of these sayings like, a watched pot never boils. If you've ever gardened, when you plant your seeds, it tells you right on the package that this plant is going to take 60 days to mature or 100 days to mature. It's written right on the seed packet. And yet you see people plant seeds, especially people who are new to gardening. We'll see them plant seeds and then within days, they're looking and looking. Whereas the growth of these plants and the maturation of these plants is months away. They imagine that they're going to give some kind of hyper-attention to the plants. And so they're out there every single day making sure no weeds grow, looking for the seed to sprout, watering the ground, and so on. And what we often find is that too much attention kills the young plants. Too much watering, too much jostling about, too much attention, impatience, looking for fruit, prematurely, not understanding the timing. The timing, the natural timing of the fruits that are desired often causes the plant to die. We've often had problems growing green beans here on our farm. And this year, we had an incredible green bean crop. And there was one difference between our care of the green bean plants this year and in all previous years. This year, we planted the green beans out in the field, away from the house where it's impossible to get any water out to the field crops. And we usually reserve the field for, for plants that don't need much water, like corn. And this year we stuck the, be the beans out there. And we were worried about getting them water. And we ended up never being able to provide them with any watering. And we had the best bean crop ever. 
And we learned this year that the problem that our green beans have had in past years was that we gave them too much care. We were on top of them too much. We watered them too much. This year, we left them alone. They received nothing but the natural water of the summer rains. And the harvest was abundant. Caring too much isn't good. Nor is caring too little, of course. But experience teaches us to care just enough. Not too much, not too little. And many parents, especially in homeschool circles, especially when they have only young children, care too much. And they wear out and break down their young plants. And if they would talk to an experienced teacher, the teacher would say, as I did, you need to calm down. These studies that the child is undertaking are difficult studies. Most college students can't read a line of Latin. These courses are designed to be self-paced because that's how real learning works. If you impose an artificial timeline on the studies, you're going to find that that almost always causes more harm than good. And when the mother asked me, well, what kind of progress should I expect? I said, your goal should be to see the boy make some progress every day, to get better every day. That's the only true progress that can be sought. And if you're going to refuse to accept that and demand on imposing some artificial requirement, you're just going to vex yourself and wear this kid out. And that's what normally happens. The parent ignoring the many, many factors that prevent the child from moving faster just wear the kid down until he finally quits. And what's worse of all is that that parent is responsible for making that kid averse to those studies forever. And every time that kid thinks about that subject, he thinks back to those miserable days getting yelled at by his mother for not making progress. And not only does he fail to study them in his youth, but he'll often choose to never take them up when he's older. And so this impatience has a doubly negative effect. To share another story to illustrate this, I remember when I was a kid, I was always into sports and my parents never needed to urge me to practice because I loved it. And I remember one time I watched a, a show about the tennis player Jimmy Connors. And I never liked him as a player. I was a John McEnroe fan. But the 
the show was about his life and childhood, and, and they were interviewing his mother. And they were asking her how she led her son to have a such a love for tennis that he would be willing to do the work that was necessary to become a professional. And she said that the way that she taught her son to love tennis was to only give him a few minutes to play. She would teach him a lesson, let him practice for just a few minutes, and then make him stop. And she said he always complained when it was time to stop because he only got a few minutes to play. And she just tantalized him with the game. And this produced in him a love for the game. And he was always eager to play more and do more. And then as he got older, he had more and more time and could pursue it on his own. And he pursued it zealously. <clears throat> but I remember watching that and thinking that she taught her son to love tennis by only letting him have a little bit of it and then making him stop before he ever got weary of it. And I remember thinking about that saying, that's how I feel about baseball. The games are always too short or basketball. It seems like as soon as the game starts, it's time to stop football game. We kick off, the game's barely played, and the first quarter is already over. And when you play sports, one of the things that makes you love them so much is that the time of the games feels so short, and you have to stop and wait for the next game. And that's an important principle that applies to all good things. We often think as parents that if something is good, we have to push and push and push. And we wear our kids out in these things. The old saying, familiarity breeds contempt, is found true in many of the good things that we try to push our kids into. We act with good intentions, but not with prudence. We wouldn't want someone to push us the way we push our children. And so even the golden rule tells us that what we're doing is wrong. If something is truly good, our children should be able to discern that. They should desire it. And we should be careful that we don't wear them out, trying to push them into it unnaturally or impatiently or prematurely, rather than allowing a natural desire to develop in the child the way Jimmy Con Connor's mother motivated him to play tennis. And this is what we see in many of these young homeschool families where the kids are just worn out by impatient and to a degree hypocritical parents because as I said, it's hypocritical because the parents would not like someone to do that to them, nor do parents do that to themselves. But they do it to the kids, and they just burn the kids out. Progress, real progress in any good thing, is impossible unless 
There's a desire for it in the child. And cultivating this desire, cultivating this appreciation, is more important than pushing the kid to some artificial measure of achievement. Artificial, first of all, because you've created the timeline. It's artificial, it's not real. And second, artificial achievement, because the achievement is not being made by the student, but by the parent. And this never works, though it's very common. It never works. And so parents need to consider more than the superficial academic achievement, just like a parent needs to desire more from the piano instruction than mere performances of simple songs. We have to desire the real fruits of learning. We have to understand that they'll never come unless we cultivate in our children a desire for them. So that our children become the sources of these pursuits and not the parents. When that desire is cultivated in the children and when they've learned the proper techniques and methods, that's when real achievement will begin to be born And it will come faster and faster, like a fire spreading. So if you're getting started with young children, what I always tell parents is to take your time Forget about academic achievement and focus on what really matters. And that's two important things. The first important thing is developing in your child the skills that are needed for learning. The real skills. And these include, I shouldn't say skills because they're not just skills. I should say prerequisites, cultivating or or providing the prerequisites for true learning. And those include the basic skills of learning, like the ability to read, the ability to type, the ability to write and so on. Many children have parents trying to push them into Latin studies and they still can't read well. They can't spell or write. And this is backwards. Another thing that's prerequisite for true learning is self-control. Children have to learn to sit still, to be quiet, to be able to participate in an activity for an extended period of time, not to bounce from thing to thing to thing like a bouncing ball, but to be able to concentrate and maintain concentration for an extended period of time. You've surely been to church and have seen the kids in church who can't sit still or climbing all over the pews, tearing stuff up, climbing all over their parents, making noise. And if you watch, the parents are just constantly trying 
to give the child something else to do. First, they pull out a juice cup, and the kid takes five seconds to drink the juice, and then he throws the juice cup, and next the parent is picking the kid up and holding him and trying to rock him and comfort him, and the kid's squirming around and kicking, and finally the parent puts the kid back down after another 10 seconds, and then back into the diaper bag to grab some crackers. Now the kid's got a cup of crackers that he's chewing on, and that keeps him occupied for another 15 seconds, and then he gives the cup back to his mother, and then he's, he's tearing into a hymnal, and it just goes on and on. This kid just goes from one activity to the next, to the next, to the next. And the parents act like it's their job to just stay one step ahead. And they've got this all wrong. You can't teach a child to be good at church. He should learn these disciplines at home. He should learn to be quiet. He should learn to be able to sit still, to follow instructions, and so on. We teach these things to our dogs. We'll teach our dogs to sit, to be quiet, to wait, and so on. We teach them to our dogs, but then we imagine that they're not appropriate for human beings, which should be taught even more to control themselves and be respectful. Not less than dogs, but more than dogs. But it's this idea that the parents are just going to keep this kid satisfied from one thing to the next to the next And it's their job to provide this constantly changing, constantly stimulating entertainment and indulgence so the kid doesn't throw a tantrum. And like anything else, the kid just becomes more and more tolerant of all of the methods of his parents. And he just demands more and more. And we can imagine this kid's at home just watching television shows, running around a room out of control, climbing over the furniture, eating on demand, and so on. And that behavior just comes into church. And that behavior disqualifies that kid from any chance at real learning. It's not a joke. It's not cute. I know it's in fashion now for priests to talk about how cute it is for babies to cry and scream in church. Our pastor just this week talked about how he doesn't mind when when babies are crying in church. And that sounds nice. That sounds cute until you look around and see that the kids who are screaming and crying aren't babies. They're two-year-olds, four-year-olds. And we're creating this culture where children don't need to be taught self-control. We're creating this culture where a mother is offended if she's asked to bring the child to a cry room so that all of the other people can listen to the readings or the homily as if that's some kind of selfishness on the part of all the people to ask the mother to take the child to the back where by the way the sound of the sanctuary is usually piped in to that back room so the mother doesn't lose anything. She simply asked to consider all of the other people. And we now find this offensive. 
as if the child should just be left unchecked. And like I said, it's not just babies. We're talking toddlers and preschoolers. And if that behavior is not dealt with when the children are young, it just grows worse and worse. And those children are disqualified, as I said, from any opportunity for real learning because they simply don't have the self-control that's required for these studies. And so parents need to give attention to those sorts of things as well. Simple discipline and training and proper behavior and self-control. Parents need to support the children. The home needs to be a place where children can learn. If dad comes home at six o'clock, plops down on the living room couch and has the television on all night, those children are disqualified because they're not going to be able to learn if half of the day is distracted by television noise. It's just not going to work. Or that father is going to, what, tell the children to study while he indulges in entertainment? That hypocrisy is not going to work. The children are going to see the father and they're going to wish that they could be sitting with dad watching the game rather than working on their catechism lesson. <clears throat> that father is not supporting his children's studies. If the parents want their children to make progress, they have to commit to a culture that's focused on learning. They can't say one thing and do another. And it's those kinds of things that parents should be focused on while their children are young. Not yelling at the child to achieve more when childhood, early childhood, isn't the time for the fruits of learning to be harvested, but for the basic skills and habits to be developed that will, in time, bear fruit. And then also parents need to understand that what the children need, if we're talking about young children, what the children need is the opportunity to maintain a routine of studies over an extended period of time, years and years. If the family wants the children to achieve great things in studies, they can't be unstable. They can't be bouncing around all over the place. They can't be back and forth on vacations and trips. And there's hardly a month where a child has a full four weeks of study time. The parents can't be slaves to this wanderlust that many modern people have just to be constantly going somewhere. There's a stability of life that's necessary for true learning because this learning takes time and it has to be allowed to grow steadily for a long period of time. So having explained all that, the real point is that when children are getting started, parents who have no experience in education, and I can say that almost no parents have experience in classical Catholic education, parents have to calm down. They have to understand the nature of this work of education. They have to understand the, the natural time frame 
within which true learning operates and develops. They have to understand that achievement increases exponentially over time, not in some kind of linear ascent from childhood to adulthood. And they have to concentrate on providing the child with the support and encouragement that he needs, not with pressure and discouragement. Because this is common in too many families, and I've seen so many families come into the CLAA like balls of fire, talking about all they're going to achieve and how excited and zealous they are and signing the kids up for 15 courses and just pushing ahead and then eventually the complaints start to come in. The concerns and anxieties start to come through. The child's not doing enough. The child doesn't like it. The child this, the child that. And it's not the child. It's not the child. The parent is creating a miserable situation and is causing the child to have no interest in these studies. And within some time, they disappear. That's a very common experience in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And I can see it right when it begins to happen, right from the very beginning. We advise the parents to sign up for just three or four courses, focus on the children's ability to get started in core courses, be patient, and the parents just want none of that advice. They're going to sign the kid up for 15 courses. They're concerned about the next course before the child has barely started the first course. And I can tell you from the very beginning that this parent is going to run these kids into the ground and they'll quit. And the parent will blame it on the kids or blame it on the curriculum, which is thousands of years old, refusing to believe that this pretended zeal for learning is not the real cause of the failure of this homeschool. And so I'd like to warn you about that. I'd like to encourage you to ask for advice. And I'm not prideful when it comes to advice. If I advise something and you don't understand why I would advise that, ask for the reasoning. I'd be happy to explain it. I'm not going to back down when I know from experience that what I'm saying is good counsel. I'm going to tell you plainly what the dangers are of another way. But if you'd like me to explain why I advise what I advise, I'd be happy to do so. Just ask. But I'd like you to remember that I've been a homeschooling father to 10 children, three of whom are already adults. I've been working as a full-time teacher for over 20 years, teaching the classical liberal arts, these subjects that I continue to teach today. And I've been researching and working in classical liberal arts education for over 25 years. And if you have no experience I'm not saying that you need to do what I tell you because you as a parent have the authority to choose for your children an education that serves your convictions. I absolutely believe that and respect that truth. But if you're going to talk about studying the classical liberal arts, I recommend that you listen to my advice and at least allow me to explain why 
your opinion about how to proceed with studies might get you into trouble. So I hope that's a helpful talk. I don't mean it to be negative or discouraging. I mean it to be helpful. I want to help you. I want to help your children. I understand the pressure and anxiety you may feel, and I respect that because these days are evil and there is a lot to be done. But I also want you to succeed in these things. And the only way that you're going to succeed is if you persevere patiently over an extended period of time. And I'd like to help you do that. So I hope that's helpful. God bless your studies.